All right, everyone, and welcome to episode seven of the Howie and the Hops podcast. I'm Chris from Howie and the Beers on Instagram. And as always, I am joined by David from the Hop Guys on Instagram. Unfortunately, Alex can't be, uh, can't be with us tonight, but David is still here. Today, we are joined by Rich and Jeremy from Utopian. So before we get cracking with the first beer, do you guys want to introduce yourselves and, and your role at the brewery? I'll let you decide who goes first. <laughs> Richard? Well, yeah, go on um, hi, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm Richard Archer, and I'm the co-founder of Utopian Brewing. So I guess I end up doing all the, all the stuff that nobody else wants to do. Um. <laughs> well put. I'm, uh, I'm Jeremy uh, Swainson. I'm the head brewer at Utopian. I, uh, I think I'm the second employee of the brewery, so just joined... Uh, Right, right before we uh, installed the brewery a couple of years ago. Awesome. Uh, so today we've got three, three lagers essentially to go through. So do one of you want to introduce this first one, and we'll uh, we'll get cracking with it. Yeah, go on, Jeremy. Crack on with the first. Let's get some beers drunk, and then we can uh, have a chat. <laughs> yeah, right, sounds so. good. So, so the first beer that we're doing today is our unfiltered uh, British lager guy here so when we when we started the brewery the first beer that we wanted to brew was a, a german style hellas lager so something that's accessible but you know malty well balanced um and and something that can sort of compete with with a lot of the macro brand uh lagers um in in the pubs um and a local brewery to us in in Exeter, actually here in Devon, um, they asked for some kegs of of our um, main lager beer, unfiltered. So you know we did a handful of kegs for them, and uh, and the next week they asked for you know another ten kegs or whatnot, and um, you know just just through that through that single customer who wanted some kegs of unfiltered beer. Um, yeah, we we started offering it to some more pubs and um, and put it in can, and you know it's become one of our biggest beers that that we uh, that we sell at this point. Um, so our premium British lager is the filtered version of this beer, um, and uh, through not filtering it, it it leaves some of the yeast um, and uh, some more of the protein material, which gives it a bit more of a fuller, rounder body um, than the filtered version. So it's a different drinking experience but uh yeah a bit bit more character or, or fullness than uh, than the filtered one nice have i am um, so i've actually tried the the filtered version as well uh i did an order with you guys not too long ago actually but yeah that that was that was lovely as well but <clears throat> i think i know what you mean about this one it just adds that just that little bit something extra just to kind of break it away from the mold a bit and it's uh I, i'm really enjoying that what you what you're saying david what you're thinking yeah, I think it's really good. You can definitely taste that there's a bit more quality in there because the, the flavour just doesn't wash away real quick. It stays with you, which is a good sign of a beer for me. I think if, you, if you're tasting it throughout the whole experience, you don't you don't kind of forget about it. Whereas some, some beers I've had in the past, it's quite straight, that's it, done. Next mouthful, done. Whereas this is like a, a, full, a full thing. Like the flavour's definitely there. And it, it is real nice and lovely, actually. It's got, the, uh, it's got like a slightly dry finish on the back, hasn't it? Which it, it makes you want that next, uh, well, in my case, in about five minutes, probably that next pint. <laughs> yeah. And we, we um, you know, we talk about it being really well balanced and fairly low in bitterness, but, um, you know, there's actually a decent amount of bitterness uh, sort of supporting the malt uh, backbone, definitely compared to, to a lot of the larger... Um, lager breweries out there so i think bitterness is is also really key even in in an easy drinking lager just to keep people coming back and it makes the beer you know taste a bit more dry and mm. and moreish really it's not super fizzy either because i think quite a lot of these bigger breweries put seem to put a hell of a lot of gas into their drinks and it, it really seems to fill you up quite a lot but this seems like it's it's super smashable if that makes sense like it's 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 easy just to keep keep drinking it is it's not going to absolutely ruin you if that makes sense yeah definitely yeah it's really important toy actually though because we all of our beers we are naturally carbonated so you know we just put the tank and the, the carbonation comes from the fermentation rather than 
artificially force gassing at, at, at pack time. Um, and also, uh, we, we don't really understand why, why anyone wouldn't do that because you, know, you get that smaller bubble, you get a better mass feel, and, and you don't get those kind of big filled up horrible kind of gassiness that you you kind of find in the in the macro lagers yeah so you should hopefully find that in in all of our beers you know that you, you've got enough carbonation to make sure you kind of get that good kind of fizz in the mouth feel but you don't so uh, don't get over over carbonated because that would be bad and stop you drinking yeah <laughs> and you want to enjoy it all <laughs> No, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think to, I think a good place to start would kind of be what's because I know you said Utopian was was did you say two years ago it started? So what, yeah, yeah. What's yeah. Utopian's journey to where you are, and what's what's your two personal journeys to to how you got to where you are today? Yeah. So, um, boy, too much about history, but but um, the, the the thing about Utopian, so. We, we found it with a chum of mine who's a co-founder who's got pubs in London. We were originally going to do it in London. Long story, we're boy with it now, but the plan is in Merton. Didn't think our idea for a brewery in a big tap room was such, was such a good one as we did. Um, I've got family in Devon. We thought actually do it rurally would be better for our sustainability kind of idea and, and also just a nicer place to do it, to be honest. Um, and of course, the other thing is it's a lot cheaper to do it down here too, which is... Um, kind of good when you're putting a brewery together so um that's how we kind of ended up in devon just over so november i think 2018 when when jeremy joel we signed the lease on here in september we'd already kind of specked out most of the brewery um and so that's when jeremy joel and then we kind of put the brewery in from january 2019 and the first brew went into trade in march 26 so that's why we celebrated our birthday um you know a couple of weeks ago now, 10 days ago so. awesome and the thing was just brew lager that was the real key thing that we wanted to do um and, and interestingly while we started with this beer and, and the unfiltered version of our kind of signature beer um was that we also knew that to, to, to kind of do this well and be reasonably successful, we probably needed some volume. We wanted to get a beer into pubs as a genuine alternative to macro lager. That was, you know, kind of one of the things that we that we set out to do, and that's why we started, you know, with that that Hellis um, kind of easily accessible and filtered it in in its kind of main instance, just because. You know, people in, in, in pubs generally, and I hope it's changing a bit now, I think, but generally would expect a lager, if you pour it off a lager tap, a premium lager tap, to be shiny, bright, and clean. Um, and if it's a little bit hazy, um, you know, that that will probably send the wrong message and they'll send it back. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess that's the, the kind of quick heads up. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been doing what we can to make some, some great beers. Uh, and, and just keep keep the story uh, around you know lager in general um trying to so core core beers set of core beers selling into into on trade and, and and cans and then a range of specials and seasonals to try and showcase some of the perhaps lesser known styles in in lager try and you know make people more aware of the massive range of beers that you can get and then you know, I guess Jerry could probably kick in now and, and talk about a little bit, but but also to try and use some of the classical lager brewing techniques, which is you know what we think and definitely what Jeremy thinks actually makes them different and 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 better in our view. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so so we set up to you know brew 100% lager beers, um, but but distinctly different in the fact that that um, you know our, our whole goal or ethos is is around the quality of the beer and um and how we brew it so you know all of our beers are spending a a minimum of a month in tank uh and a lot of the specials you know we've got a mybach uh coming out next week which is uh spent a hundred days in tank now um so so giving the beer enough time to actually uh come together and and taste the way that it should um, and focusing really on on traditional uh, brewing techniques, like uh, um, we do some some stuff like decoction mashing, where you're boiling part of your mash, and there's no real, 
you know, there's there's no really great reason or, or <laughs> to, to justify it. It's hard to justify, um, except that it, you know, we we believe it does something to the beers that makes them more drinkable or have more flavor. Um, you know, it, it's making small tweaks where we can to to maximize uh, the drinkability and and the flavor of the beers. Um, which makes it a genuine alternative, um, you know, from from the other loggers out there, because you know at least we believe it it tastes better than a lot of them. Um, and at, I I got into into logger brewing um, just b before I came to Utopian. Really, I I did an apprenticeship for three years in Germany um, at a brewery uh, after I started home brewing in in Canada. Skip that bit. Um, and then I did my brewmasters in Germany, and uh, and once I was finished with that, I was really excited to join the craft beer revolution. So I came over to the UK and uh, got a job with Camden making Hell's Lager. Um, so it, so it, was, uh, it was sort of a fluke that I ended up making lager instead of IPA or Saison in the beginning. Um, yeah, I really embraced that, and by the time I I'd heard from Richard that he was setting up a lager brewery. I was like, yeah, okay, uh, my fate has been decided. I'm going to be a, a lager brewer. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, and the last two years for me is, have, have been absolutely incredible. I've just been able to, you know, throw myself into the deep end of, of lager brewing history and techniques. And, you know, we've, we've, uh, the, the, the good thing, I guess, the, the lockdowns brought around were, were a real increase in our small pack sales and, mm -hmm. uh, and in the variety of beers that we could offer. So in the last, you know, last year, I think we, we, we brewed, I don't know, three times as many beers as, as, we, as we may have otherwise, um, yeah. with, which really allowed us to explore some different styles and, um, and, and have a lot of fun with it. Uh, yeah, definitely. the The focus for us uh, still remains on on producing our core range of beer. Uh, you know, we do a Pilsner, a, a Czech Ten Degree, our our British Hellas, and and those are you know the bread and butter, and we're constantly tweaking those. But yeah, it's it's fun to get some other stuff out there as well, which we'll try today. Well, so yeah, it is great. For the for the people that are going to be viewing and listening, um, obviously, might not be too. Um, familiar with the with the the process of of making beer how does making lager differ to making an ipa or a or anything what is the the kind of the full from start to finish if you would because i know there's words in there like cold condition people might not know understand or anything like yeah. that so, so um ale and lager de developed sort of distinctly um you know ales developed in Belgium and in and in England, uh, with the use of ale yeasts, which are called top fermenting yeasts, so they they typically ferment at at pretty warm temperatures, like sixteen to twenty degrees Celsius. Um, and uh, and lager brewing, in in comparison, uh, started to to develop only about six five or six hundred years ago, uh, specifically in in Bavaria in Germany, um, where where the brewers were fermenting beer and storing it in uh, in cold cellars so that it would survive over the winter. Um, and and the yeast that that was being used in Bavaria is is called a lager yeast or a bottom fermenting yeast, and it and it adapted to these cold temperatures. Um, so, so the biggest difference uh, to start off, um, lager is brewed with a, a lager yeast at cold temperatures and ale yeast is brewed with an ale yeast at, at warm temperatures. Um, uh, yeah, I think it, it gets a bit more complicated because th those two traditions have you know, they, there's been some exchange between the British brewing traditions and the and the German tradition uh, and Czech traditions, um, but they really developed quite distinctly. So the way that they uh, mash, so mixing the the malted barley with the water um, in order to to extract the 
the sugars out of the barley, so turning the, the starches into sugar for fermentation, uh, that process is, is different. Um, where, where in the UK, you would, you would mash the grain at a single, te single temperature. In, in Germany, you could do multiple temperature steps or, or even boil part of the mash, which is going to change the character of the beer. Um, and then it, it really follows through to the fermentation, which is at colder temperatures. And then um, it, it, traditionally you store lager beers at, at very cold temperatures, so close to freezing um, for, for a significant amount of time to allow the yeast to, to settle out of the tank naturally. Um, so the German brewers never used Ising glass finings or, or something like that, like you would use in in fresh cask beer to make it look clear. They were, they were really relying on cold temperatures to, to make the beer look bright and, uh, mm. and, and uh, yeah, clear out. Um, I know some I, people have been using like kind of seawater and, and putting, putting things out at sea and using the, sea, the, the cold temperature of the sea. I suppose that does the same job as, as putting it in some, some sort of cave or cellar or anything really. Yeah, that, that sounds wild. I, I, I did hear about a wine that they were maturing at the bottom of the ocean. There's, there's some scuba diver who's got like hundreds of thousand dollars worth of wines at the bottom of some ocean. And yeah, we, all sorts of weird stuff. Um, yeah, that's off topic. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I started. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Um, just just booking our scuba trip uh, to go to yeah. 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 Um, uh, yeah I think the the, 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 the key thing I think exactly as Jerry says yeah, is, is lager burn is, is about doing things slowly and gently and, and not being in any great hurry um, yeah and sometimes you know like special beers like the Bach will spend a hundred days in tank but but it, the, lager needs to spend a long time ferment, fermenting because we, yeah, we'll ferment our beers at like eight nine degrees whereas an ale brewer will brew at 15 and then let the temperatures rise up to sort of 18 19. That, that's going to take longer you just got to be patient you just got to let, let, let the yeast do its work in, in its own time uh, and then you got all that conditioning tank so, so so we made an absolute rule that nothing will leave the brewery uh, in our beers that hasn't been in tank time at least four weeks at least four weeks for every beer and and, and we'll, we'll, we'll never break that you know we we were under you know lockdown we had to get some beer in can and everyone was panicking and flying around and we came out we came out of lockdown and we, you know nobody had any beer and everyone wanted beer and we would, yeah, you know, we could have easily kind of just compromised that, but, but we didn't because the most important thing in the longer term is making sure that we maintain the quality. So, so that's yeah. the, the kind. Yeah. Something else. Sorry, I, mentioned, I should have mentioned earlier on as well, which is it was reminding me when Jeremy said about creating different styles and doing our our own different thing. One of the things which is very important for us, which actually came originally from a, from our, our views around sustainability, that was to use one hundred percent British grown ingredients. A lot of people said you can't do that with lager. You have to use either Bavarian malts, or you have to use you want to pills. You have to use SARS hops, or you want to do headers. You have to use noble hops. And, um, we hope that we've kind of made the case that that's not true. You can make great lager with pretty hundred percent British ingredients, and and then in terms of what we're trying to do in some of you know, the the fun we're having in, in in creating some new beers for us, different styles of beers. Is he has an old experimental program for hop growers in the UK. We we use farms, but other people are doing it too. Um, and there's some really great, interesting hops that uh, um, quite young and and, and exciting actually, because not many people are brewing with them. So we're using a lot of those those new hops and, and supporting those British growers. And and so when we talk about start be a start, what we're really trying to do is to create a British take, our take, our our interpretation, if you like of a classic style rather than absolutely trying to you know to be a dunkel or a, a bowl we're, we're we're kind of creating our take on the on those those high high level um styles if you like using using british ingredients and and our brewery in, in the uk yeah no, i think it's um probably quite refreshing as well to know that you guys use use solely you know british ingredients and you don't have to outsource stuff i'm guessing yeah, yeah but i think you know, it's, it was very important to, you know we 
there's loads more things we'd like to do and and, and it's good to see actually you see a lot of a lot of people in in the brewing industry now um genuinely talking and doing things about sustainability because the trouble with brewing right is it uses a lot of energy you have to heat stuff up and cool it down and then keep it cold um you're not the best thing in the world uh, in terms of, of, of energy usage so see lots of people doing doing things around sustainability and that's great but you know just using british ingredients if you can find great ingredients and they're local use them you know you don't need to fly things or ship things around the world um if you can find them locally so i think that's a, I, think, I think that's a general thing i think you know again lockdown's probably been quite good for that in that you know people probably think more local more um what, what can we do with what's around us rather than than, than flying off and, and so um you know that that, that, that those, those two, two things play into each other in terms of what we're trying to do um with with, with reducing our our energy consumption and yeah, that's one of the bad things we've got there's loads of things that we'd have liked to be on on our kind of curve of, of doing in terms of the de further development in in you know water treatment and solar panels and things that we've all got in the plan but but they'll come you know we'll get there we, we, we we're committed to that and we've just got to got to um, we'll wait until the time's right and, and do it as fast as we can i was going to guess with the with the kind of can art that you you're very very british bases you've got lady britannia on there uh, the, the lion the everything that kind of yeah. is uh, massively british i suppose so it wasn't a surprise that come to me where did you get the kind yeah. of the, the can kind of art i suppose who, who does it is it somebody else just done that in-house or have you got someone else to do it we actually um i hooked up with a, a brand design consultancy called kingdom and sparrow who are based in, in falmouth down in cornwall um which is you know across the border for us really but um they do talk to us down there um and um the um and and they're you know a small agency uh, but fantastic and and when, when i talked to them about what we wanted to do around sustainability and and, and british and lager and, and just doing lager um you know they're a food industry guys and they just got it they understood that you know most of the lagers are dominated by international brands you know, if you, you want to say what's the Dutch lager or a Spanish lager or Italian lager or yeah, you can name one. Um, but it's not so obvious in, in the UK. And yet 70% or something of the consumption of beer in the UK is lager. So so there wasn't really a British a British lager. We were very committed to be uh, sustainable. And we wanted to make this thing about we're doing it with British ingredients in in, in this country. Um, and so 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 the design is, and or Another thing, in, in the original site where we were originally going to do this, it was a pub called the William Morris. It was on a factory that, site that it was originally on the guy William Morris. I won't bore you with, with his history now, but he's a really interesting guy. If you want to look him up and, and go and research him. He was all about arts and crafts. It was all about reuse and recycle. So there was a lot of kind of synergies between that origin and where we were thinking about originally conceptualized the idea and the brewery. That's where Utopian comes from because he wrote a book called News From Nowhere which talks about utopian society, which is all about care for others and, and, and your link between industry and nature. So that's where utopian comes from, news of nowhere from William Morris. So the design is really trying to say, you know, this is a, an artist's animal, but there's some industrial process in it, but it links very closely to the land around you. And you need to take really lots of attention to your environment um, and connect yourself. So we actually are on a beef or a grass fed beef farm in Devon. That's where our, where our sites are on some unused barns on there. Um, and we use British ingredients and we grow fairly locally and when we process locally now in, in the local maltings. Um, so, so the barley and the malt on, on the image, there's the cows from our farm and uh, Utopiana, we call her our, our character in the middle. Um, she's holding a malt paddle and a glass of lager. So she's representing, if you like, that kind of industrialized process of the production of the beer and standing within that natural environment and connecting those things back together. So, so that's where, where the, the, the drawing came from Kingdom of Sparrow, one of the directors there. Yeah, we love it. We've, we've kind of just been through a little bit of a refresh of that, um, just to, um, which is just coming out now. So the specials actually, the, the one, the beer we're going to try next, has got the new the new um, brand design on it, and it's just really uh, emphasised a little bit more, you know, about who we are and um, 
And I think to, to just make that connection between the Utopiana character as a brewery within the natural environment of the countryside, a bit more obvious. Yeah. Oh, we're we talking about that beer, should we jump into it? Give yeah, it a try? Definitely. Go for it. Mm. Want to have a little run through this one? Yeah, for sure. So um, this is a, a, a Keller export lager beer. Um, bit of a bit of a mouthfeel so a uh, mouthful um so keller beer just refers to the fact that it's an unfiltered um beer which would be served fresh from a tank um from from the cellar of a brewery um it's an export beer because it's slightly higher abv so 5.2 percent um abv and uh, and it's in a similar style to the to to a Hellas um, at a at a higher percentage. So you get more mouthfeel, more body. Um, the fact that it's unfiltered um, uh, means that you've got a lot more of the yeast character going on in there. There's there's uh, quite a lot of yeast uh, esters. You know the aroma is pretty pretty intense for a for a light lager. Um, and and with this beer, so so we were looking to do something special uh, for our birthday, and uh, we had been working with Warminster Maltings on on so so they're based uh, about an hour hour and a half drive from us um, in the southwest. Uh, they're a traditional floor malting, so so um, one one of the few left in England. Um, and I think there's a few floor maltings up in, in Scotland making distilling malt. Uh, but it's an old school technique of making malt where everything's done by hand. They're, the guys are shoveling the malt while it's in the barley, uh, while it's uh, going through germination. And it revo results in a, in a malt which, which can have a bit more character than, than uh, one that's gone through the, the industrial automized process. We'd been working with them for about four months on trying to get us a, a lager malt that was more akin to, um, to malts from Germany or, or the Czech Republic. Um, and this is the beer that we brewed essentially with the first load of the first batch of malt from them, um, which, which I think is, has just come through really fantastic. It's got a um, really crisp sort of Pilsner Pilsner malt character, that sort of grassy hay character to it. Um, an another huge inspiration, or the, the main inspiration for this beer was actually a trip that that Richard and and I took with our with our previous brewer Killian. We went to um, to Brau, which is a, a big brewing convention in Germany, and we visited the city of Bamberg, which is which is sort of a stronghold for traditional. Uh, German brewing techniques and uh, we drank a really fantastic beer over there which is called uh, Mar a U. Um, so it's a uh, ungespundet beer which means <laughs> it's, it's uh, another difficult word <laughs> it's uh, unbunged so so we're we're closing the fermentation tank near the end of fermentation to capture CO2 that the yeast is producing in order to carbonate our beers. And, and the process of making an unbunged beer means that you don't really close off the tank so that the CO2, um, the majority of the CO2 produced in fermentation leaves the beer. So this beer is, has lower carbonation than than our typical range, and um, and it and it just makes it incredibly uh, quaffable. Really, it, you, you can just have pint after pint. I think um, so. So this was was a lot of fun for us, and it's a great memory that we had from Bamberg, and we got to use a new malt in it, um, which, which we're really excited about. You know, working with a small maltings, which is local to us you know, still upholding really traditional British malting technique, um, but still they're innovative enough uh, or open enough to, to work with us to, to make a, you know, a bespoke malt, which is really, really fantastic. 
Yeah, it's um, it's kind of like what you've already described, really. But it's 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 got more like a deeper, more complex flavour as well compared to say you know your traditional lager or pilsner or whatever. Um, and when you were saying about the you know the aromas and stuff, it's got quite like a a little bit of a floral aroma to it. But it's it's it is quite intense and strong, but it's not overpowering. And you know. It, if, for me, if something smells nice, it's more than likely going to taste nice as well. Um, yeah, it's, and like you say, it, that is just it's super super quaffable. Like it's mm. yeah, it's going to go down too easy, I think. <laughs> no, it's that's super nice. It's it's definitely a bit more bulkier and bolder than than, than the first one, but it, that's uh, totally what it's meant to be. The malt definitely stands up, and if I was to pick a lager, I'd go for something a bit more like this, something that's going to stand up. I don't I don't go for it. A normal one that's just going to lie down like your tickler's belly, you know what I mean? It needs to actually get in your face a bit and give you a bit more flavour, a bit more bang for your buck. But that's, that's <laughs> lovely, that like. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I'm delighted, you know, it was nice to celebrate. You know, we had two birthdays pretty much, and you know, we always, you want to celebrate your birthdays, don't you? When you're a business, you want to do that just as much. And um, when you're a brewery, you want to go and have, you know, we had. Plan or we'll have a Lord's birthday party, we'll go to pubs, we'll have a beer, and we'll all surf. And then they're thinking, what are we going to do now? And um, so, so we didn't really have a birthday beer because we weren't really seeing it coming um, by the 26th of March last year. So this year we planned a little bit more in advance. We thought we'd probably be locked down again. Um, if we're not, we're still going to have a birthday beer and we'll, uh, we'll have some fun with it. And, you know, Jerry said, you know, I don't know about you guys, but you know, I, I love beer right? and I love the you know, it's interesting, but, but I like drinking it most. And, uh, and the best thing yeah, about drinking most, which we're looking forward to is... Is, is drinking it with your mates and and you remember beers so i remember beers as much by where i was drinking them and who i was with uh, and things that are special about the experience it's all part of a bigger experience than just to me not to everybody but to me than just yeah analyzing the beer and 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 yeah so so oh the best best time i had is great we had a fantastic time um yeah, it was really new for, you know we were quite new we were doing stuff it was great farm we went to the best places you know, in, in the world for, for me the lagers it's just great and um mar is you know my favorite but it oh, was just probably my favorite beer i love it and uh, and i think we've done a really took a really good job in, in our tribute to it you know it's not identical it's not meant to be identical it's meant to be our take on that style and, and uh yeah we're, we're very happy with it yeah i, th I think it's a uh, really fantastic person yeah mm. it's um it's interesting that you say that i remember on it david you'll remember when we did a when we did a um a previous podcast someone else said you know having a beer is about the experience anybody anybody can sit there and you know, have a couple of cans or, or anything like that. But when you're actually out and you have a beer with your friends or, you know, the people, the minute obviously that you cannot see, it's, it, it is an experience, isn't it? And it can be a great beer with great people or it can be, you know, an average beer with average people. But you do remember it, don't you? And it's, uh, yeah, I completely understand what you're saying yeah. about that, yeah. Sometimes it just fits the moment. I mean, we've got a couple of bars and pubs that are... Uh, uh, dotted around the place in summer in some real cool kind of positions there's a there's a pub called the free trade which basically looks down all the way down the time you can see all the bridges gateshead and newcastle on either side and like having something like that on a crisp nice summer's evening just getting a little bit darker something like that is going to be the perfect thing to have just just in that moment and it can be just like you say like having mates around or there's a smell of the barbecue and going in the background that type of thing that's that's kind of what you live for when you're when you're having when you're drinking. Like it, it's, it's never fun to drink at home by yourself, is it? It's always the best times when it's 100%. like you say when it's with your mates out and about. Yeah, yeah that, that's this exactly weekend. It. Um, so so sun was out for for the first time down here, and it was actually you know decent weather to sit outside and have a beer. So you know, I drink I drink all of our beers quite regularly, but I had a pint of of unfiltered. You know, while I was starting up the grill uh, in the backyard, sitting uh, on the picnic table, and I don't know if it was the sun and my beer got light struck or it was warm or, or God knows what, but the beer tasted completely different and, <laughs> and in such a, a wonderful, magical way. And, 
you know, it's, you can't, you can't drink beer in a vacuum. It's all about where you are, what, you know, what, what's the weather? What does it smell like? Who are you with? 100%. Yeah. Can't, can't beat it, can you? And you know that, that you know, I talked about it first. You know, sometimes people, I'm not sure people kind of, I don't know what craft beer is really. I don't, I don't really know. What, you know, we're just trying to, we're an independent brewer, just trying to make really good beer. That, that that's what that's what we're trying to do. And 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 the idea of going into you know draft and on keg is we just think that makes it easier to get it out to people. Um, and yeah, and it's hard because it's difficult to get pubs, traditional pubs. And most of them are owned by some big monolith to get to change, but 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 the consequence is that a load of people drink okay lager because there's lots of people drink lager in a pub. You know, you're Sammy Gale, you're Prony or something, but but and a lot of people go to the pub and they're just because they like being in the pub and they'll drink lots of the hair. Yeah, um, let's try and get them something better, right? <laughs> just so that you can still be in the same pub. Not everybody wants to go to you know a craft beer bar or a tap room. You sometimes just want to go with your mates and watch the footy, right? Um, you know, I, that's what I want. I love doing and the rugby, or whatever. Um, so let's just try and find ways to, to get the beer better. That, that's yeah. what I think what we what we want to try and do. Yeah. Uh, so we talk about um, accessible beers. You know, so they're they're easy to drink. They're not going to necessarily blow head off. So people that aren't, you know, yet down that journey of, of you know hobby beers or really you know out there kind of neepers and stuff don't don't be scared of something that says craft or independent on it because not everything needs to be like that to start start your journey with with things that are maybe closer to what you were used to so the unfiltered absolutely is that this is absolutely you know it's maybe another level on because it's not quite like so a lot of people would, would get that but it's fantastic if you're a lager drinker and then some of the other one that's what we're going to try you know soonish and, and you know just another way to kind of go on that journey and and then you know we brewed some some collabs and stuff with which are you know what we might call crossover beers uh which are you know kind of aoli style beers or you know we an esp as a collab because because you can and it was you know it's kind of fun and and again it, all british malts and hops and all that stuff and, and it's great um so so you don't you don't have to be constrained you start somewhere and then and then you can kind of slowly slowly go as far down that journey that, that, that you want to go i guess in, in, in craft beer but, but just make sure you you enjoy the drinking experience that's the yeah. that's the key thing <clears throat> yeah definitely and i mean it's kind of like what i mentioned before we started recording i think realistically when you know when you start drinking everyone starts on well you know probably 90 percent of people start on stuff like lagers don't they and when you and you know i'm guilty to it and i'm a, you know david I, you probably are as well you kind of get when you get into the craft beer world you kind of get sucked into the ipas and the you know the um the sours and all that type of stuff and i made it me personally i made a point this year of drinking more more lagers again because you know who doesn't like a, <laughs> who doesn't like a lager and I've tried yeah. some, you know, I've tried some from you guys and I've tried some from some other breweries as well. And there's some, there is some fantastic craft, craft yeah. lagers out there. And, you know, kind of like you say, people don't need to be scared of the word craft when they think they're just going to get these hazy, like juice bombs or imperial stouts yeah. and all that type of stuff. Do you know what I mean? People can still stick to what they know and what they like. Yeah. Yeah, they do. It, it, it's, uh, yeah, that, that, typical craft beer journey that you you go from ipa to imperial stout to sour and at some point you you come back to lager um yeah it was definitely I, I was living in germany for four years and sort of like every every time i could afford it i'd i'd put in a nice order for beers from from belgium so i could get my fix of sours and and <laughs> saisons and i was you know ordering and, and drinking horribly out of date American IPAs and stuff, you know, <laughs> trying to trying to dissect them so I could so I could brew them uh, on on my homebrew kit um, but but yeah at some point you know you, any any style regardless if you're if you're if you just love traditional English ales then you know good on you if you just love Belgian beer wh whatever it is that's fine 
Um, but I don't think anything is, you know, inherently better or worse. And, um, you know, there, there's, uh, you could spend a lifetime ex exploring different loggers and, you know, trying to, trying to really get into the details of, of who's making the best ones and the nuances and all of that. Yeah. David, you, you were mentioning you had a question about that at the, um, the award, weren't you? Uh, yeah, um, I was kind of flicking through your, your guys' webpage and you got the um, the SIBA Society. I have to read my notes to this bit because I can't remember what it was. The Society of Independent Brewers. Um, you got bronze for the premier, uh, premium lager and pilsner category. How, how good does it feel to A, get recognised by that sort of stuff and how, how kind of was it that you, you feel like, oh, bronze, gold's definitely our next target how how do you plan on on getting to that point i suppose that's a great question and uh, uh, uh jerry and i review this too as well but um so this is the first year well, first year we're in march just before lockdown actually i think it was about the 11th of march so one of the last events probably before things got locked down and it was the keg national keg awards and uh, we put up actually this beer, the unfiltered beer that we drank early on, was that yeah. was actually the beer that we entered in that. And um, and we won the Southwest. And um, we didn't know until we got there. We were, oh, we've won, we've won a war. We've won the Southwest gold beer. It's great. And then you find out, oh, yeah, you find out, you go to the, the winners, the regional winners, go to the national competition. We think, hey, oh. We didn't really set out to win prizes, you know, we weren't bothered about medals, no reverse about that thing. And then all of a sudden you're standing in this room full of people with this big screen in front of you and they're announcing the awards. And all of a sudden, having not really bothered about awards or chasing awards, just kind of put it in and see what happens. We're in the charts of winning a national prize. And then you come up third, you go, nah. <laughs> <laughs> we were 12 months in to brew and beer we'd only had a brewery for 12 months and we came third in a national competition for lager it's like we should have been like dancing out the room. <laughs> we, we went out in liverpool and had a couple of beers and then we then we were dancing a little bit better but about, about half an hour too so yeah it, it is it, um, it's something that you're only interested when you win generally but it's a bit like untapped right you know you think it's rubbish unless you get a beer that's 4.3 uh, so, so, you know uh, joking aside though we, we definitely uh, don't set out to try and to try and win medals um, in other words, we're not brewing beers to, to enter into competitions. We're brewing beers because we want people to drink them and love drinking them. Yeah. And if a competition comes up that we can enter the beers into, and, and when the beer's at the right point, and it, you know, because generally that's going to be your specials a lot of the time, and it's got to be at the right point in, in, in the cycle of that beer to, to keep it fresh and, and tasting at its best, then we'll stick them in and, and see how we do. And, and actually, we probably should put this on the website, actually. Well, I thought it was, but anyway, the, uh, behind me, there's, there's two things. One's here and uh, one's here. Um, this is the, the first iteration of the Mybock, the... the <clears throat> Our rainbow beer, and in the digital awards for Seba in the summer, uh, in lockdown, that won best strong beer um, in in the national competition on digital. Which was, so that was against all sorts of beers, stats and everything. Um, it wasn't just a large category, so that was amazing. Um, when that, um, and then this one is our Vienna, um, which again is one of our kind of we sort of map that off against the dark lager, so that's around all that, that that's coming out. We're packing that uh, next week, <clears throat> um, and that one the uh, amber and dark category uh, in the national awards too. So um, yeah, no, look, don't, don't get me wrong, it's absolutely lovely, and and, and Seba winning prize with Seba was was lovely because you know you're judged by your peers. Largely, um, you know, it's, it's other brewers that, that form the judging panels, and yeah, you know, there's, there's nothing better than that, right? The guys that um, that, that that you are out there doing the same things as, and, and, and doing the same things as we are judging you. So, yeah, so I think it's good if you like, just plan plan your way through. You do you, and then if if things come to you like awards and stuff like that, that's that's great. There's no better praise. I probably should have asked Jeremy before, really, but I, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm sure he's really proud of you know when he wins awards. I, I just, you know, I've never asked him whether he wants, whether he thinks I should be entering lots more. <laughs> 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 I probably should. 
Uh, it's a fantastic day. Uh, so should be getting more gold medals. So. Yeah, I, I, I think so far we've we've only ever entered in a in a couple of of SIBA competitions, right? Um, yeah. So, so and and SIBA is an incredible in organization for you know small independent UK brewers. So it's it's really and we, we know a lot of a lot of the people who are who are judging and and who are you know instrumental to that organization so so it's really great to support them and and to be a part of that but um uh the, the whole awards thing i mean for a, for a small brewery in in our first year and a half do you, do you spend uh you know 500 quid uh to send your beers off to some competition um you know, we, we, we haven't really been too bothered. We we're, we're brewing quite a lot of beer and, uh, and we, we think it's pretty damn good, but you know, we, winning the Maybach award, I thought that was, uh, that, that was pretty cool. Just strong beer, yeah, really. um, category. That was, that was nice. Getting, getting a bronze for lager in the UK. I'm not, you know, I'll, I'll wait till the yeah. next year. Yeah, better. Um, it's crazy that you know like there's all these big competition big competitions that get a lot of press it's because it's because the competitions have got a lot of money to market the competitions because they charge the brewers that are putting the beers in a lot of money to enter the beers mm -hmm. so yeah they, they've kind of got a self-fulfilling prophecy on whether, you know, oh this is a massive award because everyone thinks it's a massive thing because the Awards companies doing loads of marketing about it because mm. they're charging you two hundred and fifty quid to enter your beer. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we're, we're selling we're, a lot of beer without without entering too many competitions. Yeah, yeah. I've got an empty glass. I don't know about you boys. You probably want to want to. Oh try yes. <laughs> <laughs> This one is definitely, definitely, definitely worth waiting for, um, and I will, I will let Jeremy talk you through this one. But um, um, I've never been happier when I first drank one of my beers. From <clears throat> yeah, so so this is our. Um, I, I think it was just as as it became clear in October that we were going into another lockdown, um, and we were going to be shifting all of our production back into can. We sort of had a brainstorm and thought, all right, is there something else that we'd like to brew uh, if we're going to be doing a lot of canning? Um, so, so we ended up deciding on a, on a Cherne Specialny. So, so this is a, a Czech style of beer. Cherne means black. Um, Specialny is, is sort of similar to export. It, it is uh, referring to the, to the ABV. So this one's 5.9% ABV. Um, and, uh, yeah, totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about this. Yeah, yeah. How I much have you had a drink I, before you started yeah, this? I lose my train of thought. <laughs> I just lose myself in the beer, right? Because this is just like... Yeah, yeah I, I haven't actually, had a Cherney in a while. No, <laughs> we know I. <laughs> I just remembered how good it was. Um, it, the the great thing about it was and, and you know when Jeremy talked to us about it we, we, we kind of we didn't we weren't actually sure whether anyone had actually brewed this style of beer in the in uh, lots of churnos but not the specialty so it might be you know certainly in, in a very rare group of, of this style of beer being brewed in the UK there, there aren't even that many of them in the Czech Republic when I was trying to you know, do some do some research for recipes. I could only find uh, a, a few of these beers that are actually brewed over there. So um, it's it's a black lager, um, but in in you know typical Czech fashion, it's got a really big body. There's some caramel malt in it, which which isn't typically something I do in in recipe form formulation. I try and stay away from caramel malts. Um, but but this beer calls for a big body, um, you know, big mouthfeel, really creamy, um, and and whereas you know a Czech brewer would typically do you know just load it with Saz hops, uh, we decided just to load it with uh, British Fuggles, um, which is a fantastic hop and is and has been you know it's being grown in uh, Slovenia and. 
and uh, used for heaps of lager brewers in Austria and, and, and European countries. Um, so really hoppy, something like 45 IBUs to try and balance out the body of the beer uh, and, and still make something that's really drinkable. So um, I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't show its ABV much. It's just really a crushable big beer, if that's, uh, if that's not an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, and I'm, I'm not just saying this because you guys are on the call. Um, I've had a couple of black lagers lately. I haven't had loads, and I'm, you know, I, I'm not by any means a specialist when it comes to black lager, but that's hands down the nicest black lager I've ever had by probably by a long shot um it's it you've got you know you've got the roasted multi flavor there's almost like a slight coffee chocolatey tinge to it and it's just it's like you say it's a, it's quite a big bold quite a big bold beer but it's still super crushable and yeah that's <clears throat> I'm really 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 enjoying that yeah good job yeah. Good. Got like a big kind of like you say, like the, the kind of caramel that really kind of comes through, slight little roastedness. It's it's kind of almost stoutish, which is what um, I've been kind of getting into. I <laughs> know probably not the best time for like summertime drinking is is necking a load of stout stone, but uh, who it's, says? It, who says? Who yeah, I suppose, Who says? Um, but it's definitely got that character, and I think that's what kind of black lager is all about. First time I ever had one was uh, I was out on night out in the city centre. And never even knew black log existed. This must have been about four, four or five years ago. And out of sheer curiosity, just went for it. And it was something that I think I finished the rest of the night on because I was just completely taken away. And there's, it's, it's such a little kind of untapped area that I think people, I don't know if it's because people don't really go for it or people don't really make it, but it is an exceptional drink when you hit it, you hit it nail on the head. And, and that, is, that is on point, really, really like it. Nice. It, it it definitely blurs the line between uh, between stout and chardonnay for and 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 lager yeah. uh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. It's um, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm a little bit taken back by because obviously I've, when I've had black lagers and stuff, yeah, they've been nice, and but I've always preferred you know a traditional lager or a keller or whatever. But that's uh, thoroughly thoroughly enjoyable. Good job. Um. I've uh, one thing, so in the, this, well, kind of especially on the, I would say, Instagram BS scene, is last year was kind of the year of the, of the triple IPA, and every, you know, every brewery did it. And a lot of questions have been asked between, um, like, you know, me and David have asked it, and there's a, there's a couple of lads on there who I know love lagers and stuff, and we keep saying, when, when is the year of the lager going to be? Um, in the kind of in the craft beer world so what would you guys envisage that coming you know this year or, or next or when when do you feel that kind of big breakthrough in the craft world lager will lager will do yeah i think uh, johnny garrett um he, he puts it pretty well i think he's been calling it the year of the lager for like the last three years or something and, and it's never really come about I, I don't think lager uh, will ever have a year because it's not it's it's not a beer style that's particularly adaptable or suited to most breweries. So so a brewery who's you know pumping out really fantastic big IPAs and and triple IPAs or, or sours whatnot, um, there there are certain restrictions in the kit. That, that could prevent them from making good lager. Like if your glycol chiller is not, not hooked up to, you know, keep beer during fermentation at the right temperature. If you're only using dry yeast, um, uh, if, if you don't have the tank capacity and conditioning tanks to store all of that. So, so I think there are, you know, I think we're gonna see a continuous increase in interest and uh, and I think all of the large craft breweries uh, we're already we're, we're already seeing them put out loggers, um, but I think it's yeah. definitely going to be sort of a slow trickle um, rather than uh, rather than ever becoming hype. Um, 
Yeah, that's how I'd see it. I think you can tell that you guys are kind of the, the kind of bare naked lager um, producers because we've had a couple. I think um, Chris has definitely had the um, the cold. I think it's, is it called the cold condition from Wylam, and Wylam are, are known for super hoppy, thick juice, but their lager wasn't didn't really like have like oh that's a lager if you know what I mean. It had like their kind of characteristic about it, whereas this is like yes. I know, I know this is coming from people who like enjoy and like making and drinking drinking lagers themselves. It's definitely a, a, a clear line. I think it's what was what was um, was said kind of um, by a, another a previous podcast with Andy from Vault City. He was like, anyone can anyone can try and make say like a sour, but they yeah. do sours, and he was like, it's like I, I could try and make wine, but it probably wouldn't taste right or wouldn't taste exactly where it needs to be whereas these taste exactly where lager should be and uh, absolute hats off to you for, for trying to do that and sticking to the guns on a flip side of the question would you ever try and do something else or would you ever say collab with some kind of people who do a lot of big hot soups like someone like Dea, for example or something like that sure and and and, and we do um and we do that already and and it's absolutely part of our of our business model that we do that um so, so our, 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 our corals are, if it's a utopian beer, it's a lager. Mm. If it's a collab yeah. beer, it could be absolutely anything. Yep. Um, but for, for lots of reasons, because it's just, um, but if it's a collab, there's no reason why you should be constrained by that. If, 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 because a collab, the reason for a collab should be because you're doing something different. There's a purpose for it, you know. A collab that's only to get two people's brands on a can in order to try and market it better is not really a collab. A collab where two brewers work together to create something interesting for the consumer, that's a collab. So so it, it could be an ESP. We were our first Czech 10, we brewed as a collab with, you know, British... Uh, British malts and weighty hops from New Zealand, and a triple decoction, it's crazy. And, and, and so, so always we'll do that um, because we'll, be, but we want to be very clear that if you pick up a, 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 a can or you go into a pub and you see a utopian cake lens, it's going to be a lot <clears throat> because yeah. people would, would trust us to do. Right, that's what we're. Yeah. That's what we do. Um, the other thing is that, that for lots of reasons. It, it, so there's lots of reasons why it's good to do collabs because we love working with other brewers. We love sharing, you know, the, 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 I worked in IT for a long time, which, which is the worst industry for sharing knowledge, right? Everyone is like this about, about what they do. <laughs> the craft beer world is fantastic because generally people go like this, right? You share, I share, I, talk, I love talking to you, I love telling you, you know, we're, we're very happy to sit on, on these kind of podcasts and, and, and tell people how we brew our beer because we, we, we love sharing the, 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 that, that knowledge and, and other brewers too. So, so pulling that together in collabs is a great thing to do and, it, and you can create things that wouldn't have otherwise been created. What's, what's not to love about that? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, we, so we, we do that and we'll continue to do that. Yeah, on sure. the collab note, any anything you can give us a hint in that you're going to be... No. <laughs> no, we, we, we think we've, we've, we've got some good ones coming out. It's really early doors, right? So we haven't even really started the conversation. But we, 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 we've kind of just got a little look in something that we think will be very exciting, but we'll, we'll keep that one. Cool. Hey, if I don't ask, I never get, you know what I mean? So <laughs> I've got them. Well, actually, there is probably one we can talk about, which um, is kind of a collab. It's not really not another brewery, so it's not really, but. Um, we we have we have brewed a, a, a collab with with uh, with Brew Republic, but that's actually this that, that's that's it's, it's a lager, so it's not um, it's not coming. Out. Yeah, there is there is something coming up worth looking out for, um, and uh, yeah, we, we we definitely want to want to you know we, we love doing those kind. Of things. But yeah, it, 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 and, and I just point out as well the, the, on on the point about um, and just quickly add in because I know we, we we've been like, like always um, I love talking and Jeremy's great at talking about here yeah. um, so um but on the point about the year of lager i think jeremy's as was exactly right but what i really like is that not everybody but but there is an, an accept a better acceptance people are trying within craft beer world that lager is okay that's that's more what we need to do because 
Yeah, the bulk of lager, the lager is the biggest beer jug in the UK, and the bulk of it is, is produced by four producers. That's nonsense. <laughs> and it, the craft beer and you know, it, it, making it okay to drink the hogger because they can be well produced. And, and there's, you go outside the UK, there's masses of great, you know, like you go to Bavaria or, or Bohemia, there's masses of great. Like, just, just, just see it as okay. Don't, don't think that just because you're trying a lager, it, you, it's, it's like you're drinking Stella. It's not okay. It's okay to drink lager. Lager's proper beer. It's just beer. Um, and, um, and 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 I think if if for me the the, the year if the year of lager whatever that is if if, if there's a, a a period of time when that becomes more accepted that it's okay then 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 that's great right because then more people will come up like us, more people will focus on building breweries to brew lager um, and specialise in it. And then you have more options to take on the macros and, and people will have better choice. And, and, um, and yeah, we'll all hopefully be end up drinking better beer. That's all we should do, right? <laughs> um, we've got some, uh, actually some quick fire questions if you're up for those, just dead short. Yeah. Short short answers. So I'll I'll let you decide who goes first and who goes second. Number one is favourite utopian beer, either to drink or that you've enjoyed brewing. Which is your favourite so far? Uh, check ten. Is that um, ten degrees? Yeah. Okay. Rich. Uh, unfiltered. The unfiltered Harris. Just easy to drink. Just great. <clears throat> awesome. Um, outside of lager, because I'm assuming that's probably both of your favourite styles. What is your uh, what's your favourite style of beer? Um, I, I I really love saison. I, I typically have a few bottles of Phantom in my cupboard uh, for special occasions. Yeah, nice. or non-special occasions. <laughs> <laughs> a weeknight will do. <laughs> <laughs> I really like English bitter. <laughs> I, yeah. I just, like, I, traditional, I, yeah. Uh -huh. Same. I guess it's the same as lager, really. Kind of just great. <laughs> who, who, who's uh, who's a go-to for you for for English bitter? Well, um, probably um, uh, landlords is probably a great. You know, the one I go for. Um, I love Harvest Best is a, I just, you know, kind of really like drinking that too. I just, um, I, I, I like kind of, <clears throat> I never really had a favourite beer ever, I don't think, probably. Probably maybe Young Special, I kind of, probably pretty close in, back in the day um, when it was brewed by Youngs in Wandsworth. Um, that was probably right up there for me. But. Yeah. Cool. What's um? What do you think's going to be? It doesn't necessarily have to be a particular beer, but what's going to be your go-to beer over the summer? Uh, unfiltered, uh, ten degree lager. Um, Just list the whole portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> Everything from, from, an, from another brewery. Um, Sierra Nevada's got like this uh, summer Cali Ale, which is pretty banging, and they somehow managed to get it over here pretty fresh. And they sell it at uh, at Sainsbury, so yeah, you can't go wrong. Nice. <laughs> Another brewer. Um, I think. That's a very good question. I hadn't really thought about. Um, <laughs> actually, no. Do you know what um, the, um, the the other great breweries who you know kind of started out with lava are doing a great job and, and were you know kind of inspiration for us in 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 some ways is, is um, Keller Pills from Austin Grounded is a is a really 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 good beer and uh, um, I definitely drink that. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna do the final one because it's probably mine and David's favorite qu <laughs> favorite question. But there was one question I did kind of want to ask is, and I haven't had a chance to ask it yet. Is what kind of what's your what's your long term goal for the brewery as as, as a whole? 
not um, obviously you know it's obvious that you want to get lager out there to the masses and you know like you're saying you want people to drink essentially better beer in pubs but is that is that your sole goal as the brewery or is, is there something in the background that you want to bring forward as well? Um. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, the um, I think the balance between um, being a business and being an independent brewery um, is is the biggest challenge for us. The, We've got to get to a point, for me, what, what I'd love to be um, is that there are independent brewers in the UK, part craft from it, I don't, know, I don't know what it means, independent breweries, I and my independent, just let's say not the big four, right? Instead of being happy with 8 to 10% of the market and 3,000 breweries or something fighting over 8 or 10%, I want to be part, I want our brewery to be part of something that's taking that segment to 20% of the UK beer market. So, so the rationale with making, in, you know, lagers that are accessible in pubs and keg beer is because we want our beer to be more broadly drunk. And, and we absolutely love the craft beer, you know, the, the, the bowl shops and the tap rooms and we try to support those guys as much as we can and we price in a way that tries to make our beer affordable to everybody and give those guys margin so that they can they can promote our beer and, and love so love it and that's because we're trying to grow share because we want more people to drink our beer that that to some people comes across as we're very you know we're kind of commercially minded yes we are because we want to be bigger because we want pe more people to drink beer in, in this world. And then if we do that, more people will be drinking better beer by definition. Um, and, and so, so I think that's, that's the one thing, right? So and absolutely to do that and, and, and to showcase, if you like, what, what great independent brewers like Jeremy and his team can do. And, and by focusing on quality of care, the beers like this Chernay, like the 10 degrees, which is right at the other end of the scale, really, as a session, 3.9 session lager, and all the things in between, um, that, that, that demonstrates, if you like, the efficacy and the ability of that team to just create great beer. And now we make it accessible. So everybody sees the brand, they recognize the brand. That's, I want to drink that more than I want to drink something from a mass produced macro brewer. And let's try and take this to more people, let's get more people on that journey, let's make it 20%. That's really, um, that's really what, I, what I'd like to see us being a part of, right? We don't do that on our own, that means, and, and there's loads of great breweries, you know, that are doing that, um, and, and getting bigger and taking it to more people and, and making beers that are perhaps a bit more accessible and, and not scaring so many people and maybe not being quite as, you know too tight if you like in terms of the style appeal of what they're trying to produce mm -hmm. yeah I think that's that's a it's a long answer to, to no, it's a short question it's great <laughs> no no not at all i think i was uh I, you know you can't i don't think you can get fair on that really um yeah that's fair enough david do you want to do the honors with the uh <laughs> the last yeah, the last <laughs> the last the last question i suppose has got nothing really to do with beer but what is your go-to meal deal? Oh, like, like from like any anything. It's That's open to a lot. Could be supermarket. Could be fast food uh, restaurant. What's chicken. what's your? Let's get into the let's fast get into the food, mate. Definitely, hundred <laughs> percent. What was that? What's sorry? Five strips, Kentucky. Absolutely, every day. <laughs> nice <laughs> barbecue dip and. Sweet chili. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, I, I, I feel quite quite uh, lost here. So so meal deal, like what what would you go to for food? Um, yeah, fuck. Um, 
I'm just, so, so I got like Tesco's hammered into my mind, meal deals for work, and there I'm just picking up like a bag of mixed nuts so I can snack <laughs> all day during work <laughs> and, and never need to sit down for a proper meal. So, That's yeah, the bag, healthiest answer I think we've ever enough. had. <laughs> never will have. <laughs> The, the last one was, uh, what was it? A large Big Big Mac meal with uh, nine chicken nuggets. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> so <laughs> you're, winning, you're winning on the healthy, the healthy vibes. <laughs> great, great. That's a great honor to have. <laughs> no, um, guys, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. We really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. It's been and I, I know for a fact I speak on behalf of both of us here, it's been really, really nice to speak to someone lager-based. Um, I think it's quite a niche in the, you know, in the in the craft beer world, but it's it's a niche that needs exploring by more people. So we really appreciate guys being on. It's been fucking awesome. Your beers have been fantastic. And uh, yeah, thank you, man. Really appreciate it. And thanks for everyone for listening, as always. Cheers. It was, it was Chris, a lot of fun. Thanks for having us on, mate. And um, we've really enjoyed it. And um, just just one last thing for anyone who's, who's got to the end, um, you know, well done. But we love on this podcast to um, you know, say thanks for listening. Um, so we will set up a code on our web shop, um, which will be Hawaii the Beers, no spaces. And that'll be a one off, one single use, but you get uh, 10% off your order. Um, as a little uh, little thanks for us for listening to your pod. So uh, oh, amazing, amazing, guys. That's great. Yeah, cheers, man. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, of course. Uh, that's uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah.